Reverses the cover deposits. No, it they had sufficient reserves to cover deposit. No, Did they have anything. They had sufficient reserves to cover deposits. I don't understand this class. There's a good old-fashioned word for people us. We call them suckers. And there are other people, people who stay up nights figuring out how to take away what they've got. As you see, the top hat is still worn, but today only by a few. We are at a historic turning point. Money as debt is a form of slavery. It's just, it's changed everything. Congress, in essence, has ceded total control of the value of our money to a secretive uh, central bank. I don't hang around trying to read the entrails of what some statement in the administration may say, because it's our responsibility to make up our mind about these things. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Picture a party of the nation's greatest bankers stealing out of New York on a private railroad car under cover of darkness, stealthily hiding hundreds of miles south. The key difference in, with the CBDC is that the central bank will have absolute control and also we will have the technology to enforce that. It's a secret meeting at the time, they told nobody about it. The details came out later, but this is the place where the most important people in the world first came up with the formal plan to create the Federal Reserve. This place is crazy. I have alleged that there is a money trust. Better for the state relative to cash. Hi, welcome to Jekyll Island. To begin, First, make a selection at the top. Second, please insert cash on the left or credit card on the right. According to the Bank of England's World War II archives, the bank had almost given up hope that war could be averted by the start of 1937. And by February, the Treasury sent a questionnaire to the Bank of England about measures to be taken before the outbreak of war. And Treasury representatives are on duty at U.S. embassies and major world capitals. This vital role, and indeed, Treasury's important involvement in the very life of the nation has continued throughout our history. Wink, wink. Unsurprisingly, in July 1938, the Bank of International Settlements facilitated the transfer of certain gold reserves from various European central banks to accounts at the Bank of England. Down the bright, straight road towards a new understanding in Europe. And so at Hitler's Munich headquarters, the agreement that has made the biggest headline since the armistice. Let no man say that too high a price has been paid for the peace of the world until he has searched his own soul and found himself willing to risk war and the lives of those nearest and dearest to him. Let no man criticize the bargain that the statesmen of Britain and France have struck. On September 30th, 1938, signing the Munich Agreement, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and French Prime Minister de Lattier agreed to Hitler's terms and ceded the annexation of Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia. One of the most tragic and ironic scenes in all history. The settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem which has now been achieved is, in my view, only the prelude to a larger settlement in which all Europe may find peace. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it, as well as mine. Something they termed, quote, peace with honor.
Within six months of declaring that he wanted no more territory anywhere, he violated the Munich Agreement, marched in, and took the whole of the Czech state, though he had specifically promised, I have no further interest in the Czechoslovakian state. On March 15, 1939, Nazi Germany's invasion of Czechoslovakia took place on the Ides of March. So ominous to that once great Caesar. 5.6 million pounds of gold was transferred just days after the Nazi siege of Czechoslovakia, a major catalyst of the war. This was facilitated by the Bank of International Settlements and the Bank of England. In total, some 736 million pounds of gold, worth more than a billion today, were transferred out of the accounts held by the National Bank of Czechoslovakia and into German Reich Bank accounts. Economic historian Albrecht Reichel says the Bank of England agreed to the transfer, quote, in cold blood, pretending not to know. Archives released in 2013 revealed transcripts of private letters and phone calls with Bank of England officials. These archives revealed in part that in May 1939, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer wrote to the Bank of England Governor Montague Norman to ask about holdings in Czech gold. Norman deflected the question, but explained that the Bank of England, quote, held gold from time to time for the BIS, end quote, but denying any knowledge of which BIS customers were the owners of said gold. War. Precisely at dawn on September 1st, without warning, the German Wehrmacht rolled over the Polish border. September 1, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, which officially triggered the start of World War II in the history books, just a few months after the Bank of England gold fueled Nazi coffers. That September, with the outbreak of the war, the BIS Board of Directors, which incidentally included several top German industrialists and Nazi officials, agreed to remain open and officially neutral and controversially continue to make a number of transactions on behalf of the Nazi regime that have, in hindsight, been deemed unconscionable. The BIS as an institution was regarded as suspicious by both London and Washington officials. Regardless, just during this period alone, the BIS shipped over 92,040 pounds of gold to New York to deposit in its personal Federal Reserve account, while it shipped nearly 8,000 pounds total on behalf of Germany, Estonia, and El Salvador to both German and New York banks. Between 1938 and 1939, the newly formed Monopoly Committee, officially named the Temporary National Economic Committee, was authorized by FDR to investigate big business, tighten regulation, and attempt to free up frozen capital into liquidity for what turned out to be the upcoming war. Big business apparently found the prospect of hearings and accountability, quote, terrifying, as newspaper accounts of the time illustrate. In December 1939, some 29 leading executives, including several from J.P. Morgan and Kuhn Loeb and Co., were called to testify. Civil penalties of forfeiture and banishment were proposed for violations of antitrust statutes, as criminal consequences were rather lax, which the Chamber of Commerce claimed could, quote, be intended only in terrorism to terrorize all those who engage in business, end quote. But in the end, the majors of finance found a way to converge their interests with the majors of government, and business found a way to, ahem, survive. Somehow. In June 1940, the Bank of England introduced Treasury deposit receipts as a new element to facilitate government borrowing during World War II. The Bank of England internally declared, quote, The chief economic danger of war is that prices, wages, and costs will run away under the stimulus of government purchases impinging on restricted productive resources. It will be necessary, therefore, to ensure that civilian demands on industry be reduced at the same time as government demands expand. The best way to ensure this is by drastic income taxation and direct limitation of competing consumption, by rationing absolute prohibition of private consumption or specific deterrent taxation." End quote. How can I be expected to keep up this estate with continual taxation draining what little resources I have got. 
That same month, FDR prepared for the American entry into the war, ordering U.S. rearmament and aid to Britain. The president doubled the size of the Navy and handed down a fleet of World War I era ships to the U.K. Military bases were expanded, the draft was instituted, and the Lend-Lease program began, giving defensive infrastructure to allies or protectorates around the globe. And in London and every other British city and town, they read about what was going on in Europe, and they got sore about it. By September 1940, outrage boiled over after German U-boats sank the SS city of Brenners, a steam passenger carrying refugee children on their way to Canada. Years later, it was revealed that the ship was also carrying a secret cargo, some 4.5 billion pounds worth of British gold for transfer which just might have been the reason it and other ships were targeted. More than half a century afterwards, marine researchers compiled a comprehensive list including maps, documents, and gold hoards recovered from the bottom of the ocean, proving that the Bank of England was regularly shipping huge quantities of gold to the U.S. and elsewhere during not just World War II, but World War I as well. A huge operation totaling something near a billion dollars worth of gold, according to forensic estimates but maybe much more. Between November 1940 and February 1943, the Bank of International Settlements shipped over 11,000 pounds of gold and eight different shipments to Lisbon, Portugal. In the decade of 1941 to 1951, the Federal Reserve facilitated government debt for the duration of the war and another six years after by pegging low interest rates and high liquidity. In March 1941, along with all the other issues of war bonds, liberty loans, and similar programs that raised billions of pounds to fund the war machine, the British government sought maximum publicity for War Weapons Week, which became plural after several sequels to get the public to openly opt into becoming junior merchants of death. Go victory! that they created the money, did they not? Well, the banks create money when they make loans and investments. How did you get the money to buy those $2 billion worth of government securities in 1933? We created it. Out of what? Out of the right to issue credit money. I'm not just anybody. I'm your fairy godmother. And there is nothing behind it, is there? except our government's credit. That is what our money system is. If there were no debts in our money system, there wouldn't be any money. That's a laugh. As if everyone don't know, there's no such thing as competition anymore in this country. The banks responded quickly to the call, and within a few hours' time, they provided the ransom money. That is the secret of American prosperity. Now, wait a minute, Roger. I don't believe we've given enough weight to the influence of government in this field. On July 31st, 1941, newspapers ran major headlines about the fresh discovery in U.S. banks of a $3 million fund, subsequently frozen, that was established by German industrialist Fritz Tyson, notorious by this point for his role in funding Hitler's rise from obscurity to power and for backing the Nazis through the end of 1938, at which time Tyson ostensibly dissented against prevailing views. Specifically, Tyson's account, seized by U.S. authorities under the Trading with the Enemy Act, but returned after the war, was established through the Union Banking Corporation, which he set up in partnership with Wall Street bankers Noteworthy as the principal directors of Brown Brothers Harriman and Skull and Bones members. Oligarchical collectivism in all its wretched form is so crystallized in this building right here, where people like Bush and Harriman were involved in the skullduggery of any given year and decade that they were alive and active, which was for quite a long time. W. Avril Harriman, the premier diplomat and future governor, his brother E. Roland Harriman, 
and Prescott Bush, the future senator and father and grandfather, respectively, of two future presidents. During the 1920s, Tyson placed these men on the board of Union Banking to manage his interest in America. And in 28, I thought we were going to bring the world down on top of this because uh, we were lending money abroad and building up tariffs. During the period when the Dawes and Young plans funneled huge amounts of money to Germany to pay for war reparations and finance industrial expansion. By important issues, do you mean domestic issues, Senator, or issues of national security? Well, I would say issues of paramount national interest, national importance that might really affect the national security. As the papers noted, Brown Brothers Harriman partners knew about the connection. Quote, our partner, W.A. Harriman, was in Europe in 1925, and at that time he became acquainted with Fritz Tyson. At one of his meetings with Mr. Harriman, Tyson told him he was forming a bank in New York to look after his interest in the United States and asked Mr. Harriman to serve on the board. Mr. Harriman agreed that certain of his associates would serve in this capacity, and so various members of the Harriman organization, now Brown Brothers Harriman and Company, have been on the board ever since. End quote. If you want concentrated evil boiled down into a cube, Skull and Bones, Nazi banking, setting up the Soviets, the Federal Reserve. Then look no further than Brown Brothers Harriman, the site of the Skull and Bones firm that merged with the British Anglo establishment. Avril Harriman's role was particularly notable, as he was from 1941 onward FDR's special envoy to both Churchill and Stalin during World War II. Americans in London are looking after the interests of Britain and the Allies. Mr. Avril Harriman is personal envoy of President Roosevelt with the task of helping Britain to get the assistance needed from the United States. Embedded in London, later Moscow, and intimately involved with Churchill informing the Atlantic Charter. Harriman's London mistress, Pamela, and later wife, was married to Prime Minister Churchill's son. When FDR blocked Harriman's attempt to include himself in closed-door negotiations with Stalin, Churchill personally requested FDR to allow Harriman to stand in for the American president during their allied power talks with the Russian dictator. Mr. Churchill with Mr. Harriman were starting their talks with Premier Stalin. See photo 18 of Harriman, sandwiched between Churchill and Stalin, filling in for FDR, whose reluctance to travel positioned Harriman as de facto power broker during one of the most important moments in history, the carving up of the world. Meanwhile, Harriman was the only U.S. diplomat capable of cultivating a personal relationship with Joseph Stalin. They traded prized horses, spent personal time together, and Harriman enjoyed access to Russia not afforded any other Western individual. As the point man for the Lend-Lease program, Harriman was in a position to promise war materials to Stalin while maintaining his significant personal investments in Russia and pre-war Germany. To that end, this heir to the Harriman Railroad fortune scrapped perhaps billions of dollars of U.S. ships at the end of World War I, reconverting them for his shipping business, the America Hamburg Line to Germany, import-export business particularly benefiting German industrialists, including the German Carnegie, the heir to the biggest steel corporation in Germany, Fritz Tyson only to turn around and give perhaps billions of dollars in aid through the Lend-Lease program to provide a war materials to Soviet Russia, England, France, all to fight the very forces that had been built up by American and German industrialists during the interwar period, particularly through the Dawes and Young plans. One, two, three, what are we fighting for? According to Walter Isaacson and Evan Thomas in The Wise Men, Harriman, quote, often seemed a sovereign in his own realm, end quote, and was often able to personally call the shots on American foreign policy, even when he lacked authorization to do so. Furthermore, according to Isaacson and Thomas, when Harriman carried secret dispatches between London and Moscow during World War II, he chose as the combination on his diplomatic case the numerals 322 the Skull and Bones Society's secret number. The connections here were unlikely to be casual or unimportant. 
Avril remained an active director of Brown Brothers Harriman throughout the war and through Brown Brothers and Brown and Shipley Company, his many entangling international investments also connected back to N.M. Rothschild London and the Bank of England. They were literally involved in financing the Nazis during World War II. Before that, they were literally involved in setting up the Soviets to the extent that uh, about a block from here at the Federal Reserve New York building, the Harriman family was funding Russian organizations, giving them money, funneling it through front groups, and setting up the entire uh, Bolshevik revolution. Author Anthony Sutton goes into more detail than we have time for here, quote, in brief, while the U.S. public was being assured by the U.S. government that the Soviets were dastardly murderers, while, quote, Reds were being deported back to Russia by the Justice Department, while every politician, almost without exception, was assuring the American public that the United States would have no relations with the Soviets, while this barrage of lies was aimed at a gullible public. Behind the scenes, the Guaranteed Trust Company was actually running a division of a Soviet bank and American troops were being cheered by Soviet revolutionaries for helping protect their revolution. There is much more here just under the surface. As for Fritz Tyson, a biography based on his memoirs entitled I Paid Hitler was published during his imprisonment in a Nazi concentration camp beginning in 1940. He was liberated in May 1945 and German political and war prisoners. Among them, one of Hitler's former financial backers, industrialist Fritz Tyson, with his wife. And found to be a lesser offender during denazification tribunals, with a relatively small portion of his assets penalized and much of his fortune intact. He died in Buenos Aires in 1951. August 14, 1941, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill, along with other representatives, issued the Atlantic Charter. And Roosevelt became a mighty name in a world that went to war. Meeting with Winston Churchill off Newfoundland in August 1941, the president aligned the power and prestige of the United States on the side of the democratic nation. Together, Roosevelt and Churchill issued a statement that came to be known as the Atlantic Charter, proclaiming to the world those guiding principles of freedom on which they were firmly united. Stating broad economic and political goals for after the war, before the United States had even entered it. On September 3, 1941, Churchill endorsed the development of an atomic bomb, and staff began work on the infamous Maud Report, which would be completed on October 3rd. Churchill, too, with bustling exuberance, persuaded most political opponents to forget his past. On September 11th, 1941, declaring that conspiracy has followed conspiracy. Conspiracy has followed conspiracy. FDR cited the disputed Greer incident where a World War I-era U.S. destroyer was allegedly fired upon but not sunk. The president remarked, When you see a rattlesnake poised to strike, you do not wait until he has struck before you crush him arguably attempting to bait the U.S. into the war. On December 6, 1941, Roosevelt's head of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, Vannevar Bush, met in Washington with leaders of what became the Manhattan Project to organize and accelerate the research necessary to produce the bomb. You know, up to now, I kept thinking that everything science did was good. My training, I suppose. Now I'm not so sure. The S-1 division was initiated. The following day, on December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The Pearl Harbor attack resulted in FDR declaring American entry into World War II on the following day. Emergency. 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 
December 8th. Our union is asking its members to invest every dollar it can in these bonds. And with God's help and your dollars, we'll win this war for democracy. In World War II, as part of its powers to conduct open market operations, the Fed bought bonds from the Treasury to help finance the war. Fed officials felt that providing that service was essential to victory. So the Fed bought all the bonds the Treasury wished to issue that were not bought by the public. On March 26, 1942, FDR signed Executive Order 9112, guaranteeing loans to industry for war production, which was further expanded on April 24, 1943, in Executive Order 9336. According to the Federal Reserve website, the New York Fed engaged in foreign transactions on an extensive scale. It held gold and dollar accounts for 59 foreign nations. The Federal Reserve puts new money into the hands of the banks, which in turn creates idle deposits. There are no excess reserves to use for this purpose. Whenever the Federal Reserve System buys government securities in the open market or buys them direct from the Treasury, that is what it does. What are you going to use to buy them with? You're going to create credit? That is all we have ever done. That is the way the Federal Reserve System operates. The Federal Reserve System creates money. It is a bank of issue. Beginning in July 1942, the Federal Reserve pegged interest rates for the Treasury bills it bought in mass to three-eighths of a percentage rather than two to four percent in order to finance war costs, which grew to approximately 85 billion in 1943 and over 91 billion in 1944 alone. The Bank of England likewise engaged in secret wartime activities in support of the War Office, not only the production of notes and handling of large quantities for major military offensives, but also for special purposes such as sabotage, subversion of underground movements, and airmen's purposes. In December 1942, the Nazis dropped propaganda leaflets over northern Egypt in the form of facsimile reproductions of the Bank of England's emergency one-pound notes. On the back of the fake banknote was a message written in Arabic that read, in part, Signs of disintegration. If you inspect this banknote, you will remember the time when it was worth ten times its present value in bright shiny gold. The strength and riches of the mighty British Empire supported such notes, but that greatness is fading as in the value of this worthless piece of paper. Each battle that England loses causes a further weakening of their currency. The day draws near when even the beggars in the street will refuse the British banknote. Also in 1942, over 4,000 pounds of gold was sold and shipped from the BIS to Bulgaria and three to four different shipments, just by the way. From Berlin and Tokyo and Rome, we have been described as a nation of weaklings, playboys, who would hire British soldiers or Russian soldiers or Chinese soldiers to do our fighting for us. I know that I speak for the mass of the American people when I say that we reject the turtle policy and will continue increasingly the policy of carrying the war to the enemy in distant lands and distant waters. Circa 1943, the Federal Reserve Banks organized victory fund committees and established plans to market war bonds in cooperation with commercial banks, businesses, and volunteers. On April 20th, 1944, Italy's Central Bank transferred over 27,000 pounds of gold to the Bank of International Settlements based on commitments it had made to the bank during the 1930s. Our target is two million pounds. Only two million. Now it will be necessary for everybody in this city or interested in the city to do their very best to make up that two million pounds. You're only asked to lend this money to the government 
They're not asking you to give it away for nothing. Beginning on July 1st, 1944, while World War II was still raging and supposedly nobody knew who would win the war, the bankers and government officials of the world's leading countries were attending the Bretton Woods Conference, formerly known as the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference, to arrange the next global monetary system, resulting in a decision to make the U.S. dollar the world reserve currency backed by gold and to peg all other currencies to the dollar. Bretton Woods further created the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, or IMF. Despite opposition, a measure to liquidate the Bank of International Settlements as soon as possible, that is, the central bank of the central bankers, was also approved at this time. However, this was never implemented, and the idea was abandoned by 1948. It's fascinating to realize that from the implementation of the Bretton Woods Conference, financial crises became so rare as to nearly stop happening, while every period beforehand was marked with continued cycles of boom and bust, panic, and crash. Once the U.S. dollar, the world's reserve currency, was taken off the gold standard in 1972 by the Nixon administration, a new period of hyper-crises suddenly emerged, putting the last several decades of volatility into sharp historical relief. Throughout the war, the Nazis had stolen gold reserves from Czechoslovakia, Belgium, Austria, the Netherlands, and a greater part of the gold reserves of the Bank of Italy. But they weren't just stealing gold from central banks. Just a few weeks before Germany surrendered and World War II officially ended in Europe, the American army discovered a huge gold hoard that had been stashed some 2,000 feet underground in an abandoned salt mine in the small town of Merkers, Germany behind a thick steel door, the keys to which were found in the hands of the central administration of the Reich Bank in Weimar. The army hastily flew in an American banker from Paris to inspect the treasure. Among thousands of bags of German and foreign currency, not to mention suitcases and trunks full of gold and silver belongings looted from people's homes throughout the continent, the army discovered 8,307 gold bars, 3,326 bags of gold coins, 55 boxes of gold bullion, 63 bags of silver, one bag of platinum bars, and eight bags of gold rings and human teeth stolen from the victims of Auschwitz and Buchenwald. And 27 authentic paintings by Rembrandt. It was later confirmed the entire gold reserve of the Reich Bank was down there, and the New Yorker reported that this was the first time in modern military history that one side of a conflict had captured their enemies every red cent. Soon to be president, but then commander of Allied forces, Dwight Eisenhower even came to inspect the massive find. It also later came out that American General George Patton had hatched a plan to hide the gold from the American government, instead wanting to use it as a hidden reserve to buy military weaponry. But news about the gold supposedly got leaked to the media before Patton's plan could be realized. It's been estimated that the Nazis looted the equivalent of over 9 billion of today's dollars worth of gold from central banks over the course of the war. And less than half of that was recovered at Merger's mine. As medium's Peter Presker wondered, where did the rest of the gold end up? On May 7, 1945, Germany surrendered unconditionally, effectively ending the European front of World War II. On August 6 and 9, 1945, the United States dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima, then Nagasaki, killing hundreds of thousands of civilians. A 
following day on August 10th, Japan surrendered unconditionally, ending World War II hostilities. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world, that God will preserve it always. Swarms of United States aircraft fly in formation overhead. The final United Nations victory has been won. Brotherhood is no longer an outmoded planet of religion, but the very price and condition of man's survival. That's why we're holding this forum. Now it's up to you. Listen, consider, discuss. This is your forum. What is capitalism? Part 10. 1946. Just after the war and 250 years after its creation, the Bank of England was nationalized making this powerful yet private frenemy matchmaker even more quasi-governmental, as private shareholders holding Bank of England stocks enjoyed a healthy 12% in annual dividends, the government converted their holdings into 3% treasury stock, granting them 400 pounds for every 100 pounds to equate the same returns. In July 1947, President Truman signed the National Security Act, Converging the different sectors of the military under the Department of Defense, establishing the National Security Council, and setting up the CIA, etc., 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 and putting everybody in the country on a need to know basis. In 1948, President Truman fired Federal Reserve Chairman Mariner Eccles and demoted him to the Federal Reserve Board, despite the fact that he had several years left in his 14-year term as chairman because he opposed the policy of continuing fixed interest rates for the Treasury as it had done throughout World War II, instead wanting market rates to match the now significant inflation that had triggered a recession. This contentious issue continued an interagency debate between Fed officials as it overlapped the Marshall Plan. But six days later in Paris, the delegates of the Western European nations finally affixed their signatures to a significant document. The Marshall Plan had received the green light. AKA the European Recovery Program that pledged more than $13 billion of U.S. money between 1948 and 1951 for the reconstruction in Europe, as well as the Korean War, which started in 1950 and temporarily brought back wartime controls on interest rates, prices, and rationing. The magnitude of America's future role was given graphic expression by a single sentence in the British press. Never before has one nation carried a greater responsibility for the fate of others in time of peace. Reduced to its simplest form, the bulky Paris report meant that America must again send ammunition overseas. Ammunition for peace in the form of food, machinery, skills, and dollars. Figures quoted reached $17 billion. Just after freezing prices and wages, President Truman called a meeting with the Federal Reserve's Open Market Committee. Truman called the entire Federal Open Market Committee to the White House to give them a tongue lashing. Never before had a president gotten so directly involved with trying to influence Fed policy. And subsequently issued a public announcement that the FMOC agreed to maintaining fixed interest rates on Treasury securities. Shortly afterward, on February 5th, 1951, then-Federal Reserve Board member Eccles and other board members 
went to the press, contradicting the White House, with Eccles stating he was astonished at the president's false claims, instead asserting that no agreement with the Federal Reserve's Open Market Committee was actually made. On March 4, 1951, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury made a joint announcement known as the 1951 Accord upholding the independence of the Federal Reserve Central Bank, acknowledging its claim to create monetary policy without obligation to or interference from the Treasury Department, White House, or federal government generally. I mean, wow. Eccles resigned from the board and retired on June 21st, having not at all been f***ed with by a mere president of the United States. The details of that can be found in his memoir. Truman, the president who proclaimed the buck stops here and who gave final authority to drop the atomic bombs, creating awe around the world at the immense power it unleashed, and who presided over World War II victory and a new era of American dominance, might have been arguably the leader of the free world, but he was told no by the Federal Reserve Board not only embarrassed, but put in his place, once and for all determining that the executive branch did not have authority over the Fed, not the Treasury, or the President. That, apparently, is where the buck stops. What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a President of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency. There is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. And so long as that is in place, what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. Because the Declaration of Independence was stolen so the banks could do what they like? The post-war period is remembered as a relatively prosperous and idyllic one in the United States, particularly if you go for that whole 50s nostalgia thing. I'm hungry! President Truman, speaking from the White House on national radio and television networks, declares that the threat to peace which the world is facing today has been created by the rulers of the Soviet Union. Because our freedom is in danger, this is why we are in such grave danger. Our homes, our nation, all the things we believe in are in great danger. This danger has been created by the rulers of the Soviet Union. The danger we face exists not only in Korea, but Europe and the rest of the world are also in very great danger. Well, the present situation is dangerous. We're not going to ignore the danger. We have the strength and we have the courage to overcome the danger. The danger that confronts us, the present danger. The American people have always met danger with courage and determination. I am confident we'll do that now. Danger. Despite the Cold War, and plenty of instability in the forms of coups and revolutions at the local level of the global chessboard, it was also a period almost completely absent of financial crisis and economic instability, as the Bretton Woods Agreement had the world trading for the almighty American dollar. Not that it was altogether free from problems. The workers' efforts create wealth and supply the money for government spending. The government has no money of its own except what it takes directly and indirectly in levies and taxes from every pay envelope. Collecting each year $100 billion or more in federal taxes, the Internal Revenue Service probably has continuing contact with more citizens of the United States than any other agency of the federal government. Its more than 60,000 employees staff a national headquarters office, seven regional offices, several service centers, nearly 60 district offices, and 900 local offices. What are you going to do about it? Recession hit hard in 1958 after the Federal Reserve created $2.25 billion in excess credit. Foreign central banks redeemed some 2,000 metric tons of gold in just one year, the largest acknowledged loss in a single year by any nation in history. Billions scattered in all directions. 
In October 1960, gold prices hit $40 an ounce on the London Gold Exchange, exceeding the target price of $35, with inflation headed out of control. On January 22, 1961, just after his inauguration, President John F. Kennedy issued his first economic report to Congress, noting that while the post-war economy had been free from major depression, it had also endured four recessions over the last 15 years. Despite 1960-61 to 61 setbacks, this economy was now regaining momentum in response to action taken under the 1946 Employment Act, quote, to promote maximum employment production and purchasing power. According to JFK, gold was leaving the country at a rate of more than $300 million a month, while there was a $10 billion deficit in international accounts. Thus, he aimed, quote, to restore confidence in the dollar and to reduce the deficit in international payments. End quote. Meanwhile, the Kennedy administration piloted programs for food stamps, housing, price stabilization, tax programs, etc., etc. In February 1961, JFK pledged that the fixed $35 an ounce exchange rate would be officially honored with foreign creditors. Right after that, a secret agreement was reached between the Federal Reserve and the BIS which began the London Gold Pool in an effort to suppress price increases in the London gold market. Each country's central bank pledged certain amounts of their gold, and a dump and reimbursement scheme was coordinated with the Bank of England and respective member central banks. The United States pledged a full 50% of the gold, around 120 metric tons, and Germany, England, Italy, France, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Belgium each pledged between 4 and 11% of the remaining pool. It had the effect of making the gold market stagnant and keeping prices from fluctuating as independent buyers were discouraged and non-Western nations largely kept at bay. That's where we're fooling ourselves. On June 4, 1963, President Kennedy issued Executive Order 1110, which, contrary to popular belief, was an order designated to enhance the use of Federal Reserve notes, which were then backed by gold, and phase out the use of silver certificates. As the price of silver continued to rise about the face value of coins and notes made of and backed by silver. However, the order granted authority to the Secretary of Treasury to issue temporary silver certificates during the transition period to enhanced Fed notes. In the larger picture, the idea was to divest the U.S. government from its obligations to purchase silver established back in 1890 with the Silver Purchase Act. The Treasury Secret Service Force protects the integrity of the coins and currency so vital to our economy. Even the seizure of a $2 million consignment of phony bills before they could be circulated doesn't attract nearly the attention that their constant and tireless protection of the president and his family does. The president at all times is under the protective cloak of the Secret Service. Since 1901, this small corps of dedicated treasury men have had this formidable responsibility. For this is their primary mission, a mission for which they are prepared to give their own lives. On November 22, 1963, JFK was assassinated. The details and true motives remain heavily disputed to this day. banking system successfully adapted itself to the changing needs of our dynamic economic system. The predictions that were made 100 years ago have generally been far too conservative. Nobody can predict what the American scene will look like 100 years from today. But we can be sure of this central fact. The American commercial banking system will be a part of that scene. And they built great cities, monuments to their progress. Yet for all their vast achievements, something of their dream still eluded them. The average American remained vaguely discontent, aware that his goal of a better way of life 
had still not been fully realized. There was something missing. John. Yes, Mary. John, what's happening to us? I think we both know, Mary. It's just that we seem to be drifting apart. I'm sorry, Mary. I have tried. Oh, I don't blame you, John. It's just that... It's not your fault either, of course. It's just that, that we don't have... Exactly. There's this awful gap in our lives just because we don't have... Oh, but why talk about it? It's just that... Oh, I keep hoping someone can find a way to... Don't be a fool, Mary. You know that's impossible. Oh, I know. It's just that... Dad, it's ironic. With all our technology and industrial know-how, we still don't have the one thing that could give us a better way of life. In 1963, the Sibba Foundation held a conference of extremely influential people in the burgeoning fields of biological and medical science, with none other than Sir Julian Huxley at the helm. Huxley, who had been the first head of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, better known as UNESCO, the global agency that held the tagline, quote, building peace in the minds of men and women, Titled Man and His Future, this typically elitist conference floated topics such as control of reproduction in mammals, world population, eugenics and genetics, potentialities in the control of behavior, and future of the mind, all of which centered around Huxley's keynote titled The Future of Man, Evolutionary Aspects. This directed human evolution whirlwind of a talk landed ultimately upon, quote, psychosocial evolution, a topic closely identified with Teilhard de Chardin's concept of the noosphere, which Huxley described as, quote, a covering of the Earth's sphericity with a thinking envelope whose components are interacting with a steadily rising intensity, generating a powerful psychosocial pressure favoring a solution of least effort by way of integration into a unitary organization of ideas and beliefs, end quote. It is also a concept that sounds incredibly like what we now know today as the World Wide Web. One key aspect of humanity's future psychosocial development involved the economy, which Huxley brought up right after mentioning his brother Aldous Huxley. The author best known for his dystopian work Brave New World, but who also wrote upon Utopia and The Island. Julian Huxley identified the present economy as nothing more than self-defeating and geared only towards consumerism, with the Western economy largely dependent on persuading more and more people into the belief that they needed to consume more and more products, in turn leading to overproduction combined with world maldistribution, complicated by automation and underemployment, masses neglecting the recipes for healthy and happy living, and the dissipation of talent and energy into non-productive channels. I am not an economist, Huxley said. I would only suggest that we start looking into the problem from the other end and aim at a worldwide system based on the idea that progressively fewer man-hours will be needed to furnish the material substructure of life, but progressively more man-hours for occupying the time that is freed, a system in which the stigma of not being employed full-time would be removed. In other words, we need a fulfillment economy aimed at providing opportunity for everyone to find some interesting or significant occupation during the half or more of their time which will not be gainfully employed in production. This will be as radical a change as that from a barter to a money economy.
By 1967, the gold pool faced catastrophic losses after the mounting costs of the Vietnam War, great society social programs, and other major factors, including the major deficits on the part of the U.S. with international accounts, resulting in an accumulation of dollars in foreign hands subject to redemption in gold. On December 7, 1967, a $475 million drop in the Treasury's gold stock was announced, though somewhat expected by markets. Five days later, a memo from the Federal Reserve expressed panic over the drain on the London gold pool and acknowledged that the Treasury's falling gold stocks were saved from further losses only by logistical acrobatics, which is, if I had my wish, definitely the name of a band that I would sing for someday. Any takers, just, you know, hit me up with an email or something. Namely, a $250 million purchase of gold by the United Kingdom in turn to set off a $150 million purchase by Algeria. Concerns were expressed about countries getting out of the pool, and fears went wild. By 1968, the London gold pool had trouble maintaining reserves against non-Western gold purchases, while increased media leaks made it impossible to keep the thin veneer of their gold price-fixing illusion. Inflationary depression and stagnant gold pools? On March 17, 1968, the London gold pool officially collapsed. But why some say the moon? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. But because they are hard to the moon. On August 15, 1971, President Nixon was pressured to close the gold window, denying foreign redemption of dollars for gold, and effectively declared the United States bankrupt for the second time, as it admittedly did not have enough gold to meet demand. The fixed rate of $35 an ounce was officially ended. Tectonic plates were in motion, and paradigms were crumbling. Two song titles that I plan to put on my first album for my new band, Logistical Acrobatics. The most compelling reason why President Nixon acted now is not being mentioned publicly. Last Friday, a number of countries tried to cash in their paper dollars for gold from America's dwindling supply. Nations have always had the right to do this, but they haven't until now, in order not to upset the international monetary system. A high administration official said privately that when this international discipline showed signs of cracking, the United States had to act quickly. There are twice as many paper dollars in foreign treasuries as there is gold at Fort Knox. A lot of people seem to be saying that some action, no matter what, is better than no action. David? Once, when the British pound was in trouble, it was said there were only two people in the British Empire who truly understood international finance. Two elderly, white-haired clerks in the Bank of England, and they disagreed with each other. Well, there's one thing in Mr. Nixon's new program everybody can understand. It stops for at least 90 days the American working people's desperate and sometimes pathetic attempts to keep up with the inflation. There is no indication when the United States will start honoring dollar bills for gold again, if indeed ever. In the meantime, the United States is beginning a series of meetings with other countries to revise the whole international monetary system, exchange rates and all, to try to prevent speculation against the dollar in the future. Notably, it was future Fed Chair and Trilateral Commission member Paul Volcker, in his capacity as Undersecretary for Monetary Affairs in Nixon's Treasury Department, who, quote, smoothly negotiated taking the dollar off of the gold standard. Volcker's coming portrayal as the heroic slayer of some inflationary dragon would ultimately be a battle with the very beast he'd unleashed on the world economy. But he tends to get all the credit anyway. More on that coming up later. In December 1971, the Smithsonian Agreement created a new dollar standard, pegging group of 10 nations to the U.S. dollar. The price of gold was raised from the $35 an ounce exchange rate created by FDR to $38 an ounce, which in turn devalued the dollar by 7.9%. 
the UK, the US, Belgium, Netherlands, Canada, France, Germany, Sweden, Italy, and Japan all agreed to peg to the dollar, fluctuating no more than 2.25%. As PBS's Commanding Heights series noted, quote, going off the gold standard and giving up fixed exchange rates constituted a momentous step in the history of international economics. Among its odd side purposes, the new U.S. economic policy aims to try to destroy the oldest myth in the world, that is, that the ultimate object of material value is gold. Faith in gold as the thing to possess is so old that nobody knows when it began, but it's easy to see why. Primitive man was captivated by its unique, shiny brightness, gold. Even in enlightened times, na nations don't trust one another's money. They want to be paid in gold. There not being enough gold to finance expanding world trade, the U.S. long ago agreed to give gold to any nation for its dollars at a fixed price. So nations accepted payment in dollars as good as gold. Gold. Well, we haven't got enough gold anymore, so with the August freeze, the president stopped all payment in gold. Now, apparently, he has agreed with France to raise the old fixed price for gold, even if we won't actually pay it. It just makes the nations that own some gold feel better. Having declared in 1971 he was now a Keynesian, and thus embracing government intervention programs, Nixon reluctantly implemented wage and price controls during 1972. By Valentine's Day 1973, the Federal Reserve and the Nixon administration were forced to announce a further devaluation of the U.S. dollar by 10 percent, as the price of gold rose to $42 an ounce and beyond, prompting Japan and European countries under the Organization for Economic Cooperation to back out of the deal, floating their currencies freely. The secondary banking crisis of 1973 to 1975 in Britain resulted from a housing bubble that obliterated real estate prices, which then put secondary lending banks in jeopardy of bankruptcy. On October 6, 1973, the Yom Kippur War began between Egypt and Israel, with involvement from various Arab countries, the United States, the Soviet Union, and European nations, a situation which our Henry Kissinger meddled in significantly. I'm just trying to organize an evasive reply. <laughs> On October 17, 1973, the OPEC nations announced an oil embargo, a reduction of 5% in oil production due to U.S. support for Israel in the war. It was announced today that gasless Sundays will go into effect as of next month. when several circuits break at the same time, we have an energy crisis. On October 19th, Nixon sent an additional $2.2 billion in aid to Israel in response to the embargo, prompting Saudi Arabia, the leading OPEC nation, to institute a total embargo against the U.S. and other Western nations, which triggered the 1973 energy crisis. Perhaps figures don't lie, but they do disagree. The president's chief economist now says maybe the fuel shortage won't be as bad as originally thought. A lot of oil men and others say it will be worse than originally thought. Whoever's right, nothing could be worse than government blowing hot and cold on the winter's prospects. The only realistic approach is to expect the worst, prepare for it, and offer hallelujahs if it doesn't happen. Britons, too, are hoarding gasoline and causing a run on bicycles and electric heaters. They, too, have several times more vehicles on the road than in World War II. Their industry is being accused of holding back deliveries to wait for the higher prices. There is the same sociological, philosophical speculation. After a generation of growing comfort, can the British find again the cohesion, the willingness to sacrifice they had in the big war? I think it's going to end with everybody changing their, their habits and... Uh, going back to the things that maybe our parents were used to that we have never seen before. We must change if we're going to have the energy we need. Prices quadrupled over the next several months and remained high through 1974 as dependence on foreign oil crippled the economy, 
which was dealing not just with oil shortages or the surging prices, but the confusing quagmire of mixed signals that is stagflation. A frustrating and disorienting period of price inflation with stagnant no-go growth. Inflation occurs when the prices of goods and services across the economy go up. When there's inflation at the same time as high unemployment and slow economic growth, do you know what that's called? I do, but why don't you say it? When there's inflation at the same time as high unemployment and slow economic growth, it's called stagflation. In the 1970s, monetary policy was too loose. The money supply was growing faster than the economy, and that led to inflation. People started to expect inflation, and they built this expectation into their economic decisions. That led to even more inflation. High inflation, plus other shocks to the economy, like a quadrupling of oil prices, led to a bad recession with periods of high unemployment. In other words, stagflation. President Nixon said in his State of the Union message that he hoped for an early Arab decision to end the embargo. Kissinger today showed no such optimism, but did repeat the president's statement that we'd not be coerced. Kissinger said he'd been led to expect that progress in Arab-Israeli negotiations would bring an end to the embargo. He detailed all the progress already made and then delivered this stern warning. To <clears throat> maintain an embargo now under these conditions must be construed as a form of blackmail and would be considered highly inappropriate by the United States and cannot affect, cannot but affect uh, the... I'm just trying to organize an evasive reply. It's called stagflation. Nixon resigned on August 8th, 1974. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Watergate was foremost on the public's mind, but honestly, it seems like there was a lot more to it. On New Year's Day 1975, President Ford made gold ownership once again legal, allowing a return to private individual investment, holding, and dealing of gold bullion for the first time since FDR's declaration in 1933. By this point, gold had soared to almost $185 an ounce. Meanwhile, the Treasury auctioned 2 million ounces of gold, opening 400-ounce bricks worth approximately $70,000 to individual purchase. When most people think of alchemy, their minds conjure up images of Dark Age relics, of proto-chemists laboring over smoking crucibles, theorizing on the manipulation of structures of metals, and purifying strange substances for their secret purposes, leading to one of the ultimate alchemical quests to literally transmute or transform lead into gold. Alchemists supposedly believed that a mythical substance called the Philosopher's Stone could create gold in this way. Famed alchemist Isaac Newton had his own recipe that he copied from Harvard-educated chemist named George Starkey for the ingredient, philosophical mercury, or sophic for short. A key ingredient in making this elusive stone. But this alchemical gold did not solely refer to the most obvious physical representation. For the alchemist, gold was also a term used to describe the process 
of the purification and perfection of any and all matter by the alchemist. Not just outward physical material, but esoteric and etheric, including the mind or the soul. Fewer consider the more occultic aspects of this internal quest for philosophical gold, a quest for what the perfectibilists may have sometimes referred to as enlightenment. The Magnum Opus, or Great Work. But I digress. In Goethe's Faust, when the Holy Roman Emperor complains of drowning in the debts incurred by his lavish court lifestyle, Faust and his assistant Mephistopheles convince the Emperor that the answer to all of his financial woes is to create paper money based on yet-to-be-mined gold. Surely there is plenty of gold buried under the Emperor's lands, they insisted, and since no one knows how much gold there really is down there, there'd be no limit to how much the emperor could promise. So the emperor signs a decree and has a thousand magicians magically create the emperor's paper money, not truly backed by actual gold or really anything at all, out of thin air to pay his creditors. And it's only later that the fool, of all characters, shows up with 5,000 crowns, which he refers to as, quote, magic papers, and asks Mephistopheles if they are really worth real gold, to which the devil responds, make a bid. It has been said that Faust was satirizing the introduction of paper money during the French Revolution, but I digress again. What level of alchemist do you think one has to be to make otherwise worthless paper turn into gold? at least in the minds of millions and then billions of people.
Sponge of money, now I've done. Sponge of money, ha ha. Sponge of money, gone, now I've done. Sponge of money. Oh, sponge of money, gone, now I've done. Great your potato. Ah, great your potato. Put a little piece of pumpkin in it, it's gonna make it yaller. Love, girl, love. Love, girl, love. Love, girl, love, girl. Sponge of money. Ah! Sponge of money, now I'm done. Sponge. Oh, mama, go sponge of money, go now I'm done. Hey, I know you like it. Oh! Money, go now I'm done. Sponge of money. I went down to town the other day, sponge of money. I see all them boys getting bouncy, not sponge of money. What I call my sponge of money, five dollars go on the trip, not sponge of money. Oh, mama, gonna mama, 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 gonna sponge of money. Love, girl, love, love, girl, love, love, girl, love, girl, sponge of money. Oh, sponge of money, gonna now I'm done. Oh, you're going to Nara. You're going to Nara. Oh, you put one half a yard in it, gonna make it wider. Oh, sponge of money, gonna now I'm done. Sponge the money. Oh, mama, 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 go sponge the money, go. La ni ni, la 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 Love, girl, love, love, girl, love, oh, love, girl, love, girl, sponge, I sponge your money, go now, I done, oh, sponge your money, go now, I done, oh, burn your money, go now, I done, oh, grate your potato, grate your potato, put a little piece of pumpkin in it, gonna make it yellow. Oh, sponge your money, go now, I don't. <laughs> hey, la, 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 I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, la, 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 la,